So Rick, welcome. Hi everyone, welcome to the 22nd webinar. It's the first webinar of 2022, Heritage Matters. The webinar started you know, to address the triangulation of the pandemic, uh, Black Lives Matter, and climate crisis. There's a triangulation, they all overlap, they impact on each other. And uh, that's how they started two years ago. And in fact, Heritage Matters was probably the first webinar in India focusing on heritage, uh, just as the pandemic lockdown started. We're still going strong. We have over 6,000 people who access our recordings, who participate actively uh, from 135 countries. And uh, because of we edit and upload the recordings uh, within a week, uh, we've had a situation where people really appreciate with time differences, you know, that we are doing it without anybody asking us. And uh, because we are generating knowledge through this webinar series. And uh, uh, our largest number of participants are from Africa and Europe, that timeline, then East Coast of United States, Asia, and the rest of the world mainly looks at recordings, listens to recordings. But I'm really delighted we get more spread of listeners across Africa, you know, and uh, because very often African countries do not have access because of the very global north uh, approach that we have in heritage related issues. So we're very happy that we're able to bridge that gulf between global north and global south through heritage matters. I myself, you know, sort of an Australian, which people think is global north, but I live in India, which people think is global south. Sometimes I'm confused because I have an existential crisis about who I am. But now that people are logging in and I think we need to start, uh, just imagine, you know, sort of uh, uh, these so-called people who discovered America is going off and calling people Indians, you know, so today is a conversation between one of the most prominent Native, Native American, N in uppercase, Native American chiefs and uh, museum directors. And uh, so what we often joke about, Rick and I, uh, is I still remember uh, in 19, I forget when it was, Rick, in Cleveland, Ohio, you were the president and you introduced me as the lunchtime speaker. And everybody was very serious. And I just went to the podium and said, thank you for that generous introduction, Rick. But I want you all to know that he is the imagined Indian, I'm the real Indian. I think that broke the ice, right? I remember everybody cracking up. And somebody told me that you have never, never laughed so loud until then. <laughs> so Rick, welcome. Most people Google uh, uh, panelists, speakers, so we don't go into the you know, introductions at length, but for the audience sake, uh, Rick West Jr. and Rick and I have known each other for more than three decades. Uh, you know, we walk the talk. I mean, people talk a lot, but we are people who get our fingers in the dirt and we walk the talk. And, uh, uh, and we've, we've addressed many issues in different parts of the world. Of course, I'm not at the same level as Rick. I mean, Rick has been a seminal leader for the whole of the Western Hemisphere, the way he dealt with issues. He's the founding director emeritus of the National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian. I can tell you, um, having been there before Rick actually started, that it must have been an enormous challenge because people, even at the Smithsonian, thought of Native Americans only in the anthropological display case, not outside. Forget being leading one of the top museums in the world. And then after retiring, he took over the National Textile Museum briefly, and then took over as the president of Jane Autry Museum of American West, which is where we met last time. No, we met last time in Kyoto. And uh, Rick, welcome. This is fantastic. Okay, you know, I, I know we are looking at the backdrop. Can you tell us a little bit about the backdrop? I, I can. We're, we're in my house, and the uh, backdrop is a painting uh, uh, 
by Tony Abeda, who is a very prominent uh, contemporary uh, native painter here in the United States. And I know him very well. I knew his father, I knew his sisters. They're all artists of the first, of the first rank. And uh, this painting is from what I call his Katsina period, which is uh, Tony's exploration of, of symbols of substance that have great ceremonial importance to native people. In this case, the Katsinas, which we normally associate with Pueblo people and with the, uh, with the Hopi uh, in particular. And I want to point out and emphasize that I acquired this painting before I became the director of the National Museum of the American Indian. So the <laughs> conflict my acquisition of this piece, uh, I made it collected when I became a director. So anything you see in this house uh, has been here for at least 25 years. Yeah, thank you. Rick, I think you touched on something which we are discussing and debating in ICOM about museum directors acquiring. And you, you clearly pointed out you, these were acquired before you became the director. Although their processes and procedures, you know, direct for directors to acquire, but there's a code of ethics. But thank you for pointing to that out, pointing that out. Now, Rick, you, you know, sort of, uh, you and I have talked several times about how we are here because of our ancestors, those that have gone before us and our parents, grandparents influenced us quite a bit. So tell us about you know, your father and mother and how they influenced. I mean, where do we see that signature of your father and mother in you? Well, it's a, it's a complicated but logical story, I think. My uh, parentage is native on my father's side. I'm a citizen of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes located in Oklahoma here in the United States. Uh, my mother was non-native and um, that's, that's, everybody associates almost immediately with my dad in my own history because that's the native side and most of my career as both a native rights lawyer and as the founding director of the National Museum of the American Indian uh, associate with that part of my heritage. But what I would also emphasize is that my mother played a very significant role in all of that too. And in this way, it was my mother who very early after the birth of both my younger brother and me, there are only two siblings in the family, agreed with my father that the family should return from California where he had been stationed in the military and both my brother and I had been born to the state of Oklahoma, which is the homeland uh, not the original homeland, I would point out, but the homeland after reservations were established in the late 19th century of the Southern band of the Cheyennes. Uh, and he wanted us to be raised in that milieu, in that cultural milieu. And my mother was very, very supportive of that. And in the day when they were married, quite candidly, uh, she crossed lines that in the eyes of her own community were unacceptable. Uh, I understand from what I have been told that her parents actually declined to attend their wedding because my mother was marrying a person of color. Uh, my grandfather uh, had, the, had the grace to confess almost on his deathbed that he regretted having ever taken that position because he considered my mother to be the most happily married of all of his children. So they, they created, I think, a family unit in which we knew why we were in Oklahoma and why the association with the Cheyenne community. And it was a calculation put together on both sides of my family, by both my father and my mother. Uh, my mother herself was a very talented artist. My dad was a visual artist and much of his work, uh, while not behind me, is all around me in this room that I'm sitting in right now. Uh, but my mother was a very talented musician, a pianist. And I think if she hadn't had two youngsters to look after, she might have considered herself being a performing artist. So she was a person of great intellect and significance. And both my parents, they played a great role in creating what became my brother and me. 
uh, later in life. I think the internet is a little bit unstable. It's turning red at your end, Rick. Now it's okay. Yeah. Can you hear us? Rick? I can hear you. I can hear you fine. And what I'm going to do, if you will let me step away for two seconds, is I'm going to open a couple of doors because the uh, the the Wi-Fi unit is in the next room, and that may that may help the signal here too. Right. So, sure. Sure, absolutely. We look at your artwork behind you in the meantime. Okay, before Greg comes back, those of you are listening, uh, 21st of September 2004 was the uh, was a phenomenal day. Uh, there were 26,000 uh, indigenous people from all of the Americas. I say all of the Americas, 26,000 on the Smithsonian Mall. And I was very privileged to be there. Our oh, Rick is back. And Rick, that was an amazing day. Thank you for having me as a guest, but also speaking at the forum the day before in the brand new museum. Uh, but, but the thing is that you introduced a whole new concept you know, of Western hemisphere. Not many people that are listening and who will listen to the recording are familiar with the idea of the Western Hemisphere. So how did you conceptualize this? National Museum of American Indian, National, Smithsonian people think that it's about, you know, United States, but you actually conceptualized with your team, the whole of the Americas. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Surely. Well, part of it was, was purely practical. It had to do with the facts of the case. Uh, in fact, the National Museum of the American Indian held uh, huge collections, over a million objects in total, that were from uh, the entirety of the, of the Western Hemisphere, both South and North, North America and South America. About two thirds of the collection uh, originated uh, from what is now the United States. Another, another third of it originated uh, from uh, Latin America or South America. And uh, a portion of it also came from First Nations in Canada. So the holdings of the museum itself uh, extended throughout the hemisphere. They weren't just restricted to the United States. So there was that point, a very practical one in terms of the collections actually held by the museum. But the conception was more significant than that. Uh, the conception was this, uh, history in the United States and in much of North America and in much of the Americas, the Western Hemisphere, is very much seen as an East-West phenomenon. In other words, an acknowledgement belated and inadequate as it is of those who are already here, but that those who came, came from the East, they came from Europe uh, to the United States. And so that is how the cultural axis of what is now the Western Hemisphere is often looked at. I think that's wrong. My view has always been that if you were looking at the indigenous cultural axis of what is the Americas, North America and South America, that axis runs north to south and not east to west. And that was the calculation it was in our minds. Rick, you're the... breaking up again. You, do you think it, you might go next door or you're breaking up your free, the image is being frozen? Um, the... the only other thing I can suggest, I can go into the next room, but I don't think, I don't think that that is the, will make the difference. What, what might help, which I, I hate to do, uh, but is if I shut down the video portion of the of the screen, um, that will sometimes help the signal. Are you are you hearing me all right now? Yeah, but then, yeah, I'm hearing quite well. Uh, that's fine. And uh, talking of that particular day, you know, twenty first September two thousand four, you know. With the whole you know parade and people coming together, the speeches, you with your turquoise regalia that we were all admiring, uh, 
there were two bald-headed eagles that were flying over the mall. Everybody said, I still remember people totally surprised saying that they've never seen bald-headed eagles at the Smithsonian over the mall. What did it mean to you? <laughs> well, it, it meant a great deal. It was, uh, it was a very powerful symbol. We sensed those who were near us because there were two bald eagles above us. And it wasn't imagination. There are actually pictures of the two eagles that circled over the National Mall on September 21st. And of course, September 21st was picked because that's the fall equinox here in North America. And we wanted to, partic to pick a particular day that, that had that kind of significance. And, and so that was very significant to us. The one additional note I would make is, if I may, is maybe, maybe hyper um, uh, ethnic for me to say this, but to Cheyennes, another indicator of spiritual presence is the dragonfly, which shows up in much of our iconography in art. And on that day, which was a beautiful day, uh, September 21st, 2004, there were literally thousands and thousands of, of dragonflies surrounding us on the mall while the two eagles were above us on the National Mall too. Did, did you, you know, the bald eagles, did it symbolize something also personal in terms of your father to you, who's a famous sculptor, famous artist? Well, the, it, it, the, the eagle is very significant to us. I have my own, my own headdress, which is just over my shoulder and, and that direction in the room here. Um, and uh, it, has, it has great significance to, especially Plains Indians, but not just to Plains Indians here in the United States, because the eagle is the bird that for us flies closest to the sun. And it has a very significant place uh, in, in all of our stories, cultural and ceremonial, uh, for that reason alone. And has thus has played a very significant part um, in, in both our stories and our regalia. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Uh, to the audience, to the participants, if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A box. Uh, and uh, they'll be moderated and clicked across to me. Um, so you've got time to do that. We, we don't open the chat box so that uh, it doesn't become a distraction in a way for other people. And uh, so any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, Rick, coming back to that, creating that space, uh, native universe, you know, with uppercase N, uh, through NMAI in the heart of the <clears throat> Smithsonian, Middle America, if you will. And uh, it, it resonated very much with something that you and I started with the inclusive museum movement. And uh, it's, that was 2008 when you and I launched the inclusive museum network in Leiden at the Netherlands. And you being a strong supporter that it's not us and them, but it's all of us, you know, which is what you did at the Smithsonian, that it's not just Native Americans and the rest, but it's all of us, you know, and, uh, and that was reflected throughout the opening those, I mean, I ended up having three dinners in one evening with three different groups of people, and they were so diverse from so many different backgrounds. And uh, so, what what does I mean this this passion that you and I share inclusion, but locating indigeneity at the heart. Hello, oh, Rick, no. you're frozen. Well, I'll I'll tell you now. You you froze Hello? just a minute. You're yes. Frozen. Oh gosh, uh, you you were frozen just a moment ago. Tell me when I'm back. But you did you hear my question? 
I did. I did. I think I heard enough because of the question. You actually called it, I think you remember we called it first voice. First voice, yeah. Yes. I, I think what the answer to your question and and thus my affiliation and my enthusiastic affiliation with the inclusive museum movement is this. The, the original uh, mission statement of the National Museum of the American Indian had three components. The first was invoking the first person voice of native peoples in their own interpretation and representation. And that was done systematically uh, in the opening of the National Museum of the American Indian, both in New York first in 1994, and then on the National Mall in Washington DC in 2004. The second principle was that any of that rep representation and interpretation must reflect the fact that native peoples in the Americas are not simply an ethnic remnant that is sitting around waiting to be pushed off the stage of history, but is very much a living phenomenon. We are living cultures and that the museum should represent them as such. In all of the consultations that we held with, with hundreds of, of native groups prior to opening the National Museum of the American Indian, the consistent theme was don't you dare let us be seen as somebody other than communities which are living under difficult conditions, but intend to thrive right now in the present. So that was the second part of the mission statement. And then the third part was to take whatever assets we had at the National Museum of the American Indian, both in terms of expertise that sat inside the house, the collections, which were cultural assets of great value, and make those available to these living native communities that surrounded us contemporaneously. We did not expect native communities necessarily to all show up in New York or Washington, DC um, uh, to take advantage of these benefits. We, through outreach programs and collaborative relationships, which were systematically established by the National Museum of the American Indian, made sure that we could export these assets into Indian country in recognition of the fact that that's where, that's where cultural continuance actually occurred. And the inclusive museum movement was, was absolutely congruent with all of those aspirations on the part of the National Museum of the American Indian. Oh, th thank you, Rick. Rick, I've just got an alert that maybe I should open the door because my my Wi-Fi router is in the next room too. <laughs> so I'm going to do oh. the same thing. But Rick, could you could you in the meantime could you tell us about the impact of the pandemic on Native American communities, which has been devastating in most parts of the world? But sure, we don't right. hear much about the impact on Native American communities outside. Could you? Tell us a little I bit will. about it. I will. While you attend to the door there, I'll be glad to say something about that. The uh, uh, pandemic, uh, COVID-19, has had a dramatic impact upon all communities of color uh, here in the United States that exceeds the impacts it's had on the general population. And that has to do with a number of factors, including poverty, uh, the uh, condition of health systems and health care uh, in communities of color uh, and certainly amongst indigenous peoples here in the United States. As many of you know, uh, much of the indigenous or native population in the United States uh, lives at great geographic distance from any kind of urban or, or city centers, uh, much of it rural and rural parts of states. And so that alone uh, made the care in the case of COVID a very difficult proposition. Um, there have been special efforts made on the part of, of nonprofit organizations and on the part of the government uh, in the end here in the United States to reach out uh, to native populations in particular uh, during the COVID time and they have experienced some considerable success in the sense that uh, 
amongst the uh, communities of color here in the United States, including indigenous people, uh, there has been consistently a lower rate of vaccination, even when the supplies were available amongst people of color than amongst the rest of the population. I'm happy to say that in the native population, at least, uh, the native population, plus I think the Asian American community have some of the highest vaccination rates now in the United States, uh, including as compared to the general population. So it is a story that had unfortunate beginnings in terms of the impact of COVID, but it looks as though it's trending toward a happier ending. Yeah, that, that's good. That's good, Rick. That's good to hear things are better. But I have, there's a question from somebody that you met maybe 20 years ago uh, when you were uh, uh, with the Ford Foundation uh, and they made your endowment to the Surabhi Foundation in Mumbai with Siddhartha Kak, who is the founder oh, yeah. of the Surabhi Foundation. He's online. He's yeah. saying that uh, when, when, you know, we met 20 years ago in Mumbai. I remember you mentioned to me at that time that the Museum of the American Indian was based on an existing building. And your idea was to consult the indigenous population as to what kind of building they wanted. How did that impact the final outcome? So you, because you, you're mentioning New York and Washington DC, you might want to explain sure. it because not many people know the, the two sides. Surely, I'll be glad to. There it's are- the uh, It remembers you very fondly. <laughs> well, I remember, I remember that, him very fondly too. Um, he, here's the story. In, there were three sites for the National Museum of the American Indian. One was in New York. Two were in the Washington DC area. One was actually on the mall. That's the one that we have spent the most time talking about. But the collections were actually housed primarily in what's called the Cultural Resources Center, which is just outside of, of Washington DC. So those are the three sites. Now, one of those, the one in New York, we didn't have that much to do with the architecture because we occupied part of a very historic and very beautiful building, but not one that we built in New York. So I'll put that one slightly to the side. But in, in Washington and in the Cultural Resources Center in Suitland, Maryland, right outside of Washington, DC, those buildings were subject to a lengthy, lengthy consultation process that went on for two to three years and involved consultations within the United States, in Canada, and bringing representatives from South America to Washington DC to consult with us about what these buildings should be. And we wanted to have that kind of backdrop. And it, it sort of ran counter to what I had encountered when I first came to the National Museum of the American Indian. I remember meeting very promptly with the head of the Office of Design and Construction at the Smithsonian about two weeks after my first step into my office at the National Museum of the American Indian. And he indicated to me, look, we're up and ready to go. Uh, the train is moving for the construction of these buildings. You need to hop aboard or you're gonna be left standing in the station alone. And I simply posed what I considered a rather fundamental question. Well, how do you come to that? We haven't even talked to the people uh, who have the largest stake in this building. And shouldn't we do that before we, we proceed? Um, I was able to win that argument. And so we entered this period of consultation. And from that period of consultation came so many things that you see uh, in the buildings that comprise our museum on the mall, as well as the Cultural Resources Center. You will see that there is, to their architecture, a very organic feel. Both buildings have curvilinearity to them that you would not otherwise find uh, in other buildings on the National Mall. Uh, there is a construction of spaces inside the buildings that reflect, if you will, a native presence the large um, area in the building on the mall that is there for live performance by contemporary native communities, dance, music, theater, et cetera. Uh, 
um, and uh, the, the ability in both buildings to look from the inside to the outside and from the outside into the building, the presence of the water element at the building on the mall. All of that has to do with things that we heard during this long period of consultation. Um, I am told that in, in the final analysis, that period of consultation probably cost us three to $4 million in added construction fees. But for me, I could not care less. It was worth far more than that for the future to have had that kind of input, which allows native people to this day to say, I know this place when they set foot in the building on the National Mall. Thanks, Rick. I mean, I, I just love it the way you say, I don't care, you know, but <laughs> the ownership, the ownership needs to be there. I still remember when you and I were running the workshop in the State Library of Queensland, Ray Sheridan, who is online, she asked you a question. She said, so how long do you think it'll take and when do you think you'll open? You said, it will open when we are ready to open. Very simple answer. <laughs> you were determined that the process, the consultation, the ownership was very much there. But in this process, you know, like you talked about the performances, the creativity, or you know, through the uh, through the site on the mall, but it attracted a certain amount of discomfort, especially with the media like New York Times and so on. But they still had a perception of a museum, like. They still would have liked to see, you know, Native Americans in anthropological past, I think. And they were shocked that you actually use contemporary creativity and so on. And you was brilliant. You inspired all of us the way you handled it. It's such dignity and straightforward principle. Could you reflect a little bit on that, that particular time? That was very challenging. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll be glad to. I wasn't always happy with what I was hearing. I'll never forget that one of my colleagues, whom uh, you know too, I think, Amar, uh, Roger Kennedy, yeah. uh, the then director of the National Museum of American History, who was one of my great mentors, and who, quite frankly, uh, when I arrived at the Smithsonian thinking, surely I knew how to run a large institution like this, uh, because of my experience in being on my law firm's uh, executive committee, I could not have been more wrong. I had no idea what it was to try to run an institution of this magnitude. People like Roger Kennedy stood at my back, protecting me for much of the time. And I remember Roger Kennedy, the very day we opened, September 21st, uh, standing in front of me, having gone upstairs and then come downstairs in the National Mall building and saying, this is it. This is the next step. Um, and I knew exactly what he meant. Uh, unfortunately, some of the culture critics at the New York Times did not think it was the next step. They were absolutely horrified uh, at what had been done in this seizure, in their view. The barbarians at the gate, if you will, who had seized the, the authority to run the, 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 the narrative, if you will, of what was said in the galleries of that museum. And it did meet a great deal of resistance. Uh, and I don't even rule out that in those incipient days of the National Museum of the American Indian, there are certain things that we could have done better in terms of, of implementing this notion of first voice. Uh, but the thesis was correct. The thesis was correct, and that was that indigenous people in the United States who had never had the ability to do so, who had had this long century-old love-hate relationship with, with, with museums that held their material, should have the authority and had the authority and the authenticity to speak themselves in interpretation and representation of their experience, past, present, and future. And that was the thesis to which we would adhere. And to this point, Amar, it's interesting. I, I know very well uh, Cynthia Chavez, the brand new director of the National Museum of the American Indian, a, a splendid, splendid uh, person, native woman, 
uh, leader, et cetera, who has now been chosen as the third director of the National Museum of the American Indian. Uh, I knew her, she worked at the NMAI when I was the director. Uh, and uh, what she said in answer to an interview in the Washington Post that appeared only about a week ago or so, is that um, she was asked that very question, well, you know, there was a little bit of a ruckus here when this place opened, and, and you got some nasty reviews from, from some notable publications. Uh, ha happily, my least favorite of those from the New York Times no longer is at the New York Times. Uh, he's now, I understand, at the Washington, at the Wall Street Journal, which makes perfect sense to me. Uh, but what she said was this, and, and, it, and it's, it's, uh, it's to, to be noted, I think, uh, Amar, for people like you and me who have been at this for a long time. She told the reporter, that if those very same shows, and she had worked on our, on, I think she had worked on our universes uh, as a curator uh, while, while the uh, Mall Museum was getting ready to open. She said that if those very same, if, if those very same shows open in 2022, she thought the reaction to them would be far different than it had been in 19, in, in 2004. And I think that she's actually right, which is to say that history may be all incremental, but there at least is a trend line going here. And I think um, that the, <laughs> the barbarians at the gate are now inside the house and watch <laughs> out because it's, it's going to change some things now in museums. It, that almost leads into the next question I was going to ask, but now it's become a comment because what you did well, is actually start a dialogue through your leadership of what's now become very popular, in, especially in Europe, but also North America. Everybody's talking about decolonization. You know, the, the, you know every conference, everywhere, everybody's talking about decolonization. But what you started was the decolonizing process from the heart of museum world at the Smithsonian. And thank you so much for that leadership because we, we people would, have rea would react differently now, but still it doesn't necessarily mean that they actually, you know, they might have sympathy, but not necessarily empathy because they don't know the difference, <laughs> you know? So they might be respectful. I think we're still a long way to go, but I think we've come this far Thanks to your leadership, I really appreciate it. Globally, we appreciate it. And in many countries, especially India, where I'm organizing this from, we're still a long way to go from. But there's a major museum project, heavily funded. Uh, the government has been very generous. Government is very clear in about consultation, working and engaging with uh, indigenous people in India. However, there isn't the capacity among people so I remember you dealt with this. You made an offer to you know, people from the museum opposite, National Museum of Natural History, welcoming people. Anybody who wants to come and join your team, most welcome to join. Uh, but uh, but you know, the reaction was ambiguous, so to say the least. So can you tell us, you know, is it because people's own lack of capacity or is it because of fear of the unknown? What was it? I still. I, I think it's actually primarily generational, Amar. And that's what gives me explanation for the past as well as hope for the future. Uh, th there's no question that being, being in the Smithsonian, being a part of the huge Smithsonian system of, of, of museums and national museums was a perverse advantage. Let me put it that way because we did indeed have the National Museum of Natural History sitting right across the mall from us. And that of course was the only museum that was the Smithsonian back when. They held also a very large native collection. We were in the throes of the repatriation legislation at the very same time uh, that I was becoming the director of the National Museum of the American Indian. Everything was kind of tossed up into the air. Uh, and you, so you had within the Smithsonian itself, 
uh, a dialogue going back and forth about what do we do about, about repatriation. On the one hand, you had the National Museum of Natural History, uh, which uh, was, had many questions, if you will, about repatriation laws and whether they should be adopted. On the other hand, you had the National Museum of the American Indian adopting in, in its own policies, the repatriation laws before the substance of them before they even became law. So there was a great variation across the institution in how that, in how that was, was going on. Um, and I was, I was actually glad for that. Uh, honestly, a backstory in this is that when I arrived at the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian was this close to going before Congress and opposing formally and institutionally the pending a repatriation legislation. I did not want that. So I got, I got us to just back off of that and, and rely on our own policies for the time being. And the uh, Smithsonian was not actually formally brought under the full breadth of NAGPRA legislation until an amendment to the National Museum of the American Indians authorizing legislation in 1997. Most people don't even know that. Um, but so there were, there was, there was a story going on back here where the, the tussle was going back and forth about this question. Um, but we won, we won that and it was accomplished. And, and so the Smithsonian now is subject to the repatriation laws where NAGPRA, NAGPRA is the baseline, not the ceiling. And for that matter, as an example, uh, the National Museum of the American Indian has the authority to recognize state recognized tribes as, as being part of the repatriation legislation, uh, not just federally recognized tribe. It's a, and I'm a lawyer, remember, and it has also a different standard of proof that is imposed that is more liberal than the standard of proof under the NAGPRA legislation itself. So we nibble and bite at the edges of this to, to get where we need to be, uh, but we have gotten there. And, and one thing I wanna add very quickly about the repatriation legislation is think of that as what it was, the, the demand that certain kinds of material be returned to indigenous communities um, as it should have been because it should never have been in a museum to begin with. But think of it in much larger script too, that the repatriation legislation in the United States was responsible for overturning and completely changing the power relationship in broader ways um, than just demanding the return of certain objects. Mm -hmm. It had to do with the presence of native people as collaborators and as active participants in the work of museums. It had to do with first voice uh, in museums, interpretation and representation, the power shift was remarkable. And that is what I think is undeniable at this point in museums. It's never going to go back. But thanks to you and others who provide the leadership, I still remember sort of being brought to Washington, D.C. Uh, Robert Sullivan was with the National Museum of Natural History. Tamara Gray was the curator who organized the seminar that I gave. You know. Tamara and Robert were arguing that the Smithsonian should support the NACPRA legislation, but the rest of the management didn't. And, uh, and, and, I, and inspirational the way you explain how things have changed. And uh, uh, I, I, I still remember it's not only the Smithsonian, but some of the congressmen were also opposed to it because they still believe in the old idea of scientific importance of the remains and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank God, you know, I remember once in Australia, uh, the founder of Australian Chamber of Music in Italian, Al Corso, uh, he said, saying to me, Amma, the diehards must die. And I understand <laughs> that some of the diehards have died. <laughs> Things are way ahead right now. But to, to the audience, especially from who are not familiar, NACPRA means Native American Grave, Go Grave Goods Repatriation Act of 1989. And uh, it, it became the benchmark for almost every country in the world. 
in dealing with human remains. And, uh, but you know, Rick, this is amazing. I mean, the people that are listening are just amazing. There's Kwesi. Kwesi uh, uh, was the director of South Africa's Robin Island Museum, a dear mm. colleague, wonderful man. He's the one who led the establishment of Nelson Mandela Museum. I mean, a real comrade, you know, sort of in terms of transformation of apartheid institutions into democratic institutions. Here's a question, Rick. I have always been curious about the, and fascinated by the matter of multiple voices of stakeholders. I imagine that the reality of the National Museum of the American Indian must have had to leverage or deal with the opportunity of problem of multiple voices. Uh, how did request navigate this? <laughs> That's a fascinating question and a very good question. And here's what I would say. Uh, I made a calculation when I became the director of the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, there were uh, three things I wanted to know, uh, and one of which would be something I had to tend to. Uh, first, I wanted to know whether there was enough support within the Smithsonian itself for this new idea of what a museum could be, uh, a, a museum different, if you will, in ways that I'll come to in just a second. Uh, and that I had in the form of the secretary of the Smithsonian then, Robert McCormick Adams, himself a very distinguished anthropologist, not of the Americas, but of, of the Middle East. Uh, and uh, he signaled at the very beginning that the, the NMAI was indeed a different kind of museum. Not the temple on the hill, but if you will, a place for multicultural dialogue, okay? So that's what I had to count on as, as a bastion of, of, of support in, inside the institution itself. And he was true to it. Second, I had to be sure that since we relied on, on the, the United States Congress for hundreds of millions of dollars in appropriations, that we had angels up there who would help us. And I won't go into the details, but we did. The third component were the native communities themselves. And it, 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 was, it was very important that the first director of the National Museum of the American Indian, and there was a question about whether that should be the case, that the first director of the National Museum of the American Indian be native, be knowledgeable about Washington DC, but not necessarily come from there, be very much embedded in his own community. And so part of the point of the consultations, which we had ahead of time, were to try to get some understanding of, of the great diversity that is indigenous Americas from North to South, Canada, the United States, on down into South America. And that, that was a very important part of, of the work of, of the consultations themselves to get an understanding of that. And what we picked up along the way were two things. Uh, one was that there are certain transcendent narratives, if you will, values, that, that do arise wherever you are looking in, indigen, in, in indigenous, uh, to indigenous communities uh, throughout the Americas. And, and so not that there's sameness, there is diversity, but, but that there were, there were certain things that bubbled to the top that a number of different native communities could, could, could settle with and be, be very comfortable with. Um, the second was this, and this told me by a number of very, very savvy political collaborators and peers uh, whom I had at that, by that point in my career. And that was that, Rick, we will do our very best to make sure that this doesn't get taken down by internecine um, indigenous politics in the United yeah. States, Canada, or elsewhere because this is our one chance, our one big chance to make a big, big statement and we're not going to screw this up. And they did not, they simply did not. And so what we did was based upon the consultations that we did, we represent as much diversity as we can 
uh, in, in the National Museum of the American Indian. In the original installations, there were 24 community originated, created, and curated um, exhibits amongst the major, the major three exhibits in that museum. 12 of them from the United States, eight of them from outside the United States and in South America, and four of them from Canada. And that was a signal about the diversity, which we understood to exist and would, would reflect and represent, even if we couldn't get the full diversity inside the building in, in every program or every exhibit. Uh, and, and that was successful. I think that that was successful. And so I don't know yet of a native community which has said, I don't really feel this institution is mine. I know only native communities in my experience, wherever they are from in the Americas, who feels, who doesn't feel that this institution is mine. Uh, it is a part of my heritage too and my future. Great. Yeah, that was so inspirational. I remember at the opening, you make sure that each of those galleries in the opening first, the people who are, whose voices were represented, they're the ones who, uh, you know, who were there, you know, sort of, I was tagging along. It was inspirational that, that, uh, that uh, what you did was first voice, not just in developing the spaces, but also first voice in the inauguration. You know, mm -hmm. people were there, so that was inspirational. Now, Kwesi has another question. Now, uh, I must tell you, Kwesi is one of these amazing South African charismatic museum directors, uh, not only with the establishment of the Nelson Mandela Museum, worked with the establishment of South Africa's Robben Island Museum, and uh, but he also deals with uh, the legacy projects, you know, so he has a question. Rick, Rick mentioned the serious economic challenges facing some of the communities represented in the museum. How are some of the physical connections made between the museum and these communities? Question number one. Number two is, how does the museum respond to invitations for it to make a more positive socioeconomic impact if such invitations exist? I work with the Heritage of the Liberation Struggle, which is a whole a legacy major project in South Africa. And one of the imperatives is to think about how this heritage can make a positive socioeconomic impact on the veterans and their descendants. We don't always succeed, but we try. Mm -hmm. So he's looking to, you know, how you dealt with, you mm -hmm. remember we used to talk about the three C's, connect, collections, communities, and connections. And, and you fostered those relationships. And also as a lawyer, you make sure that people came together yeah, they, they were on the same page. Could you speak a little bit about it? That's what Kwesi would like to hear. Sure, the socioeconomic like improvement of people in the communities. Um, let, me, let me say the following. I remember a few minutes ago, I referred to the three arms of the original mission of, of the institution. And the third arm being this relationship uh, that existed between the museum and the communities. And the notion that the... That the uh, uh, NMAI had to figure out a way to make sure that we came to the community in various ways, rather than expecting them to go find us in either New York or Washington, D.C., and that was very important. So there are two things that happened. One is that we established organizationally, as part of the National Museum of the American Indian, it had, it had four, four senior people who sat right under me not under me, but with me, and ran various parts of the museum. One of that, one of those was the uh, Department of Community Relation and Community Services. And that was for the specific purpose of on an ongoing basis, um, overseeing this bilateral relationship and the back and forth and mutual participation between us and, and, uh, and the native communities that we purported to serve. Understand, that we saw native community, we distinguished between we distinguished between constituents and audiences. We had lots of audiences, and native peoples were one of our audiences. But we had one set of constituents, and those were native people, indigenous people. 
Um, and that is to be distinguished from audience. Uh, there, there's a qualitative distinction that we made in that regard. And because we made that qualitative distinction, we organized ourselves inside the museum so that we had this relationship on an ongoing basis with contemporary native communities on the outside. Now, what did we do? There are a couple of different elements that speak to both cultural support as well as socioeconomic support. Um, for uh, starters, uh, we believed that, um, that community museums, communities out in Native America, on site, in homelands, et cetera, were the real centers of, of cultural regeneration and cultural continuance. Not the big mall museum, not the museum in New York, but the museums that communities themselves were trying to build and construct community centers, um, cultural centers, museums, it could take a variety of forms. We supported those in various ways with our expertise, which was in Washington, but could go out there. And we literally um, uh, distributed thousands of objects out of the collection on long-term loan. And this is beyond repatriation. That was a totally different thing. Repatriation simply went back in title to the, to the community. But even beyond that, there were objects in the collections that went into these community institutions in the name of, of cultural continuance and, and building culture and sustaining culture at the community level because that's where it happened. In addition, what we did are certain activities which lend economic support. The artist sector, and I say that being the son of a native artist, a visual artist, um, are, are a very important part of, of the economic life of, of those communities. And we made sure that we had programmatically things in the museum that sustained the artist communities that sat in these um, native communities that were around the United States, around the Americas, elsewhere than Washington DC and New York. So we, we, we felt that we had a responsibility uh, that was both um, cultural and economic and, and did our best to, to try to implement those ethics. Yeah, and, and you, you made a connection between, if I recall correctly, between culture, self-esteem, to building this, making people feel good within themselves, that culture has a major role. And you call the museum as a civic space in this process. Uh, Rick, the next question is from somebody uh, who is the president of International Committee for Museum Ethnography of ICOM, Ralph Mention. He says, hi, Ray, Panama. And he has a question for both of us, but I'm going to defer to you. Uh, you and NMAI were very much ahead of the time compared to other parts of the world. In Europe, we start to talk about, I mean, see, I like the way he put it. In Europe, we start to talk about decolonization for the last 10 to 10 plus years. How do you think the process will go in India, China, Russia? Uh, well, <clears throat> I, uh, I should stick to that to which I know uh, for one thing, um, but uh, decolonization can mean different things, different places, I suppose, uh, but it needs to happen everywhere. And I would say that, um, that Russia and China have their own decolonization challenges. And I hope that they will step up to them. Uh, it is easier to do so in fundamentally democratic societies than it is in others. And so I think that's why in some respects it has happened faster in, in, um, in democracies than it has uh, elsewhere. But I do hope that it happens elsewhere. Here, here's what I would say though, Amar, about decolonization and the NMAI, I always think there's a third step. There's a third way. There's no question, there's no question that the NMAI coming to us originally in the form of the old Museum of the American Indian of the High Foundation in New York was a colonial institution. No other way to describe it. It was the doing of a large collector who assembled this immense collection um, and considered it candidly a cultural reclamation project.
because it involved a cultural community or a set of cultural communities that were dead or dying and were going to disappear. And so let's at least harvest their stuff so that it can be kept in some form going into the future. The NMAI itself was a combination of decolonization, but, but something a little bit more. And I want to describe that a little bit more. You've adverted to it already, but I want to talk about it just a little bit uh, in answering this question. Uh, the, the NMAI, in terms of its talking in first person voice, first person indigenous voice or native voice, and at the same time, uh, talking contemporaneously, if you will, and not just a matter of history or past ethnography or something like that, was, was definitely a decolonizing um, instrument and was intended to be. We fully intended it to be. Uh, you, 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 it, you set decolonization in motion if you begin injecting on an equal basis, first person voice into interpretation representation. It's undeniable. You, you, can't, you can't stop it. Um, at the same time, what we were looking at at the National Museum of the American Indian, and what I certainly, I certainly felt the same way about the Autry, uh, the National Museum of the American Indian has continued to be this way, is finally the third step, the third way, is a transformation of how we understand the museum as a socio-cultural civic enterprise. That's the final step. And that's where I think we need to go. And I think there is a distinction between that and decolonization. Decolonization is a, a retrospective look that deconstructs and gets rid of, of something, if you will, institutional claptrap that you inherit from the past. What I'm talking about in the transformation of the museum as an institution is purely perspective and is hope for the future. Because if you decolonize, then you have within the four walls, and I'm not just talking physically and literally, but within the four walls, um, a variety of original voices, a multiplicity of voices. You've created civic space, social place. You've created a forum which was the very word used by Secretary Adams way back when in describing the National Museum of the American Indian. And that is a very different kind of institution. It is a house of objects, but it's a house of objects where objects are a means to an end and not an end in themselves. They tell stories, um, but they are for the purpose of engaging the community in, in which the museum sits in a continuing conversation, discussion, even controversy, but where there is hope that comes out of that for some kind of social reconciliation. And that's the third wave of museums that I hope comes out of decolonizing museums. Yeah, thank you, Rick. And I think that, uh, uh, in fact, there was a discussion and debate before the pandemic in Abu Dhabi on Nash, what makes national museums national. And in fact, both Alessandra Cummins and uh, uh, George Abungo are online, and the three of us were there. And we had to deal with you know, some of the people with the rhetoric of the universal museums. And our question was, what makes a national museum national? And I think in every answer that you gave, every you know, your whole discourse is about the National Museum is a network, right? Because I remember you, you had a whole system where the NMI, NMAI on the mall is one thing, but the tribal cultural centers, there was a whole network uh, link. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about the National NMAI as a network, you know, with the tribal cultural centers? Well, I, th I think that it, it, it was intentionally that. And originally, uh, which many people do not know, but which was the case, um, a possible provision in the National Museum of the American Indians uh, um, authorizing legislation was that there would be established by the legislation something akin to this network, um, that there would be regional institutions that would be created physically 
as part of the National Museum of the American Indian. That ended up on the budget cutting room floor uh, in Congress. And so that never happened. But what we felt at the National Museum of the American Indian was even more um, responsive and responsible was something which was a little bit less wooden than a set of regional museums and instead was proactive support of institutions that were based in the communities themselves um, of their own creation, but with our support and lending of our support in various ways. Again, um, through programs, training programs that were run at the National Museum of the American Indian uh, for the benefit of those community institutions um, and, and, uh, and, and, support, and supporting with lending collections and that kind of thing. I know originally at the NMAI, when we were finally beginning to set up the, the internships, um, it came to me as, as a program much like others in the Smithsonian of, well, this is a program that is intended to uh, benefit us in the sense that we are training people for us. And my view was, no, we are not training people for us. We are training people to go elsewhere, um, to be responsive um, to the institutions that are needed and the construction of them that is needed at local levels and in native communities. And so that's the way that we constructed ours. But, but that network was always key to me uh, because it was, it was a network that connected the National Museum of the American Indian from Washington DC and in New York to a vat to Indian country. And, and that, was, that was the objective in any event. Um, but in this forum that we're talking about, it is, it is, not, it is not only a forum that is, is entirely en encapsulated only, encapsulates only Indian country. It, it is a, a forum that, that crosses other boundaries. I want, I want to cross boundaries to other America, quite frankly, too, uh, in ways that are important. Um, so it, it, it had a very large agenda in that way, and it still does. The NMAI still does. We were already trending that direction uh, at the end of my term, and that has only continued under my successors. Thanks, Rick. It's about boundaries created through colonialism, transcending those boundaries and the kind of seamless relationships we've had across the so-called boundaries. I mean, we had a uh, 1989 in Australia, whole uh, ECOMOS, you know, symposium honor, you know, who constructs the boundaries. It's a bit like, uh, you know, uh, I remember I was asked to speak, I was recalling Robert Frost's poem, Walling In and Walling Out. You know, the kind of ignorance, you know, in creating boundaries. But thank you for your response. I have another question from Siddhartha uh, Kak. By the way, Kwesi, thank you for your questions and uh, yeah. um, and all the all the best with the amazing work you're doing in South Africa. We yes. realize it's not easy, nothing is easy. <laughs> Rick can tell you nothing is easy. But uh, Siddhartha Kak has got another question, you know, um, and uh, uh, you know, I, he says that he hopes that they can draw on your advice and vision uh, in the design of a maritime heritage center for indigenous coastal communities in the marine world biosphere of the Gulf of Mannar in South India. Any first thoughts? And uh, I have a little response for that too, but you go ahead first. No, I on this one, I'd like you to go ahead first. And then I'll... <laughs> Siddharth, it's very simple. I think because the you're, the, you're the real Indian and the local Indian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that too, South Indian. Siddharth Kak's question is for South India. And I think, Siddharth, the most important thing in India we got to start is, like Rika has talked about, respecting, honoring the first voice, first voice of indigenous people. It doesn't happen in India that easily. I mean, you do get some exceptions in some parts of India, but nationally, uh, we need a policy position on this. And this indigenous coastal communities in the Gulf of Mana, I'm familiar with the project, but I'm also conscious how important it is, for instance, why it's important to discuss liaise with Kata communities, uh, Kata indigenous people, 
uh, in Kerala. Uh, we talk about spice trade, you know, Mozare spice trade and everything, but we completely ignore the indigenous people. And I think that we need to rethink the way we address museum development. And there's a fantastic opportunity in the last week of June, thanks to Common Ground from Advana Champagne, uh, another partnership that Rick helped me with. Uh, we're having a major international conference in Missouri Heritage Center, Siddharth. Hope, hope uh, you and your project team people might join because we'll be addressing some of these issues. Uh, but thanks, Siddharth, it's really appreciated all the people who have joined in. And uh, my next question is, Rick, one of the things that I had to deal with in the mid eighties in Australia, you know, major museum directors, when we did a survey in 1985, responded by saying, this is 1985, Australia has changed a lot. Like you said, the NMAI started, now things are so different. Major museum directors said, oh, but I'm out. we would love to employ indigenous people, Aboriginal people, but they go walk about. They don't want to work. They don't understand what a museum is. And then we had amazing indigenous leaders because they were on my 19 member committee that helped me with their formative action program. They said, who said we don't have collections? They didn't talk about museum. They talked about heritage collections. Heritage collections as keeping places and sacred sites, you know, which were very often stolen those days and still occasionally disappear. Heritage collections is the more inclusive term. Museum still evokes, still evokes the idea of the edifice because we do have an edifice complex in the museum field. And uh, so, and, and uh, so I, I think that how did you, I mean, how did you, I mean, did you encounter this in the, uh, in your life journey that, oh, but Native Americans don't have museums. Well, I don't, I don't think Native Americans do have museums, uh, quite no, honestly. They have heritage American. collections. It, they have heritage collections and, and we have them in slightly different form, but the concept is precisely the same here in the uh, United States. Uh, there's no question about that, that, uh, that Native communities uh, in terms of sacred sites, and, and things that are very much analogous to keeping places uh, have heritage sites. Uh, our effort was to make sure that we came as close, apart from the term museum and the name that attached to this institution, to making this an additional heritage site for contemporary Native people. And that involved A, how we treated the collection, um, and how we involve Native people in taking care of the collection, even apart from matters of repatriation, where some parts of the collection simply went back to the community, but even how we took care of it inside. And I, I had uh, occasion recently, Amar, which was, which was good for me, of uh, going back to the Cultural Resources Center. I had not been in it. That's the collections building for the National Museum of the American Indian. I had not been in it uh, since I left, honestly, uh, the, as the director. And, and so I, I went back and it's, it's been a long time since I've been back. I was moved, touched, almost to the point of getting slightly teary about it, about how embedded the practices were in the life of the Cultural Resources Center right now that continue to make it that kind of heritage site for, for Native people. I want them to see it as a Native heritage site. Um, and I, I remember one of the first experiences, which was up in New York, um, when I hadn't been the director for more than two weeks and a number of Hopi Kasikis uh, came to visit. And uh, we took them into the old uh, uh, storage facilities in the Bronx, uh, which you've probably been in, Amar. Um, and we were walking by the, uh, the rows of casinas, many of which have now been returned to the Hopi, uh, but not at that time. This was, as I say, two weeks after I arrived. And we were just walking down the aisle and the casiques were kind of beside me and, and right behind me. And all of a sudden behind me, I heard one of the conservatives just go, oh, gasp. And, and it was because the caciques, quite properly to themselves, were 
distributing corn pollen onto the casinas as they were passing them in blessing because that's the way that they would take care of them. So that is a small indication of what the rub is and that we had to work by in making our place a heritage site. It had to do with physical parts of the cultural resource center that, that, we, uh, that we constructed. Uh, we had rooms for, uh, for ceremonies that could be performed with respect to objects that were in the collection but needed care um, uh, from, from keepers if you will, um, even, even material that was not repatriated or that they did not want it repatriated but needed to be taken care of. And so there is a physical space in the Cultural Resource Center where that happens. I attempted to make it a space that uh, quite frankly had a dirt floor. I couldn't quite get that one by the conservators, but I did get the cement out and the wood in as the, as the floor for that. It has a fire pit. It has um, restaurant quality smoke evacuators so that the detection systems can be turned off and certain, certain things can happen in that space. That is a space that leads directly to the outside because sometimes these ceremonies involve going into the outside. And so that passage is direct. It has a green room for, uh, for uh, Native people to change from what they walked in in into more appropriate attire for the ceremonies that they wish to perform. It proceeds from the assumption that every object of the NMAI, and this out of the mouths of people who don't have an ounce of Native blood in them, that those are living objects and should be treated in that same way. It goes from the fact that those collections are arranged by community all of their objects are together rather than other systems of organizations that have the pots separated from the baskets and the baskets separated from the organic material and blah, 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 blah. These are ways of taking um, even in what is always slightly artificial space and attaching the attributes of heritage care and, 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 and uh, sensibility uh, to things that even occur at and are in a museum. And so I think that the way museums become heritage sites is by taking on the attributes of what we expect to feel and see at heritage sites. Yeah, yeah, Rick, I think that's what this whole debate and the fiasco about the defin definition of ICOM should consider as one of the major perspectives. Thank you for that. There are two questions, but they can be answered very quickly, either by, by either of us, because we both have experienced this. Uh, one an anonymous attendee, I don't know who it is. Uh, there's a need to respect first voice, but he says that local governments, national governments in India appropriate the term indigenous to position themselves as indigenous friendly to mass capitalist push, which undermines indigenous livelihoods. How do you recommend we address this? It's a global phenomenon, right? I mean, we, we see it everywhere. You know, it's a constant struggle, right? Yes, it is. It is. And I, but tell me, I'm not sure I quite understand what was being said. It, is that some people take on in indigenous voice or they presume it yeah, themselves? Yeah, I mean, cooperation. Cooperation oh, yeah, yeah, indigenous yeah. voices. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that is an issue. And it is an issue here in the United States. And it's, it's one that we have had to uh, deal with uh, at, the, uh, at the National Museum of the American Indian. And I guess the way that we did that, and it was, there are certain, there are certain established laws and standards that address that partly. But in addition, I think that what we did, which helped us deal with that question, is our collaboration was always, always began by are the NMAI going to the native community, not having them come to us, but we went to them and said, we would like to invite you to have this possible relationship and collaboration with us. Um, and we're also inviting you to tell us whom you would like to participate as the, as the first voices um, and what you would like them and what they would like to say. And if, you, if that's the beginning point, 
then it, it gives you it gives you the opportunity to maximize the chances that you're speaking with creditable voices. Creditable voice, that's really important. Cooptation takes two hands, two hands to clap, two to a tangle. And I think <laughs> the challenge in India, who would ask the question is, uh, you, you know, it's also a question of power relationships, you know, sort of very often indigenous people not in position of power to negotiate, even if they have the authority, uh, are often co-opted, pushed into a corner. They, and it's India is not the only country, many other parts of the world. Uh, there's another question from Marielle Richon. Uh, Marielle, and I go back to the World Heritage Center. Marielle was the one at UNESCO who was constantly pushing, you know, like connections with indigenous communities uh, before the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples of 2007, but Maria was quite seminal in her relationship building. So her question, uh, which again was addressed elsewhere, what about indigenous people in Africa? It seems African governments even deny the very existence for indigenous people on their respective territories. What about African museums to preserve indigenous cultures? But you, you know, Rick, that the UN Declaration, Marielle, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in the UN Working Group in Geneva, Sir Martin Escobo produced five volumes of delineation of indigenous people across the world, including Africa. Still in the UN General Assembly, the declaration could not be tabled because of this question about Africa. So there was a very important Nairobi meeting with people from different parts of Africa. They met and they came to a resolution, what indigenous means in Africa. And, uh, and, and it is a, it, it, it's a question we got to keep asking after all, you know, with genetic research, we keep saying we all came, we're all, we all draw our ancestry to 10 mothers out of Yemen, you know, genetically. And uh, so we all have a maternal connection to Yemen, to Africa, doesn't matter where we are, that's what the genetic research says. But Maria, Sir Martin Escobo, UN Working Group on World's Indigenous Populations, the reports are there on, on, online. Uh, I think there's one last question, I think, because we're running. Ah, <laughs> who is asking this question? Because, you know, Sharari doesn't post the name. Uh, Papino, uh, again, you know, sort of, uh, uh, the question is, how much can museums, restitutions and repatriation processes politicize indigenous people? I'm not positive I quite un understand the question repatriation. I mean, the, the whole question of repatriation right and uh, i mean as a lawyer you know that there's three distinct terms uh, not many people people confuse them one is return another one is restitution another one is repatriation how can these be museums participating in these processes uh, be able to politicize indigenous people what they're saying i think what he's trying to say is that how do, so I, I apologize to everybody that our webinars are in English language, which is yeah. alien to most of us. Sometimes uh, there might be certain ambiguity in English, but in your first voice, I'm sure it's very clear. So we, I honor and respect that. You know, the processes, the debates and discussions about repatriation restitution, to what extent can they politicize indigenous people for their rights? Do museums have a role, you know, to promote rights-based, you know, um, awareness raising in indigenous communities? Okay, I'll I'll take a I'll take a run at it. I apologize if if I'm sort of off the mark. Um, to me, um, that it's it's not the politicization that that I that I worry about. Um, these are all cultural questions as far as I'm concerned. Um, and they should sort of be kept within that ambit. Um, and that's, that, that is the way 
I'll, I'll just deal with the example that is best known to me as a lawyer and as a museum director, and that's the federal repatriation laws here in the United States. Um, it, is a, it, is a, it is a cultural decision that is being made, not a political decision. Uh, the cultural decision is A, whether certain objects fall into particular categories. The categories are quite clear. Uh, the facts that support whether they fall into the category sometimes may be quite ambiguous. But they, but they have to be gotten through. Uh, and then um, the second question, which is also a cultural question, is whether that object, if it falls into the category, affiliates with a particular Native community. Um, and that's the extent of the consideration. And again, I, I apologize, but I, I don't quite see the connection of, of, it's not a political decision that is being, that is being made. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Kwesi has one other question. Kwesi, you got to stop doing this. The other question's coming in. <laughs> but he's, I, I mean, Kwesi is brilliant. Kwesi, he says, how has climate change impacted the work done with indigenous communities? What has the NMAI been able to attempt or achieve in terms of climate consciousness, climate impacts, and climate crisis? Well, I, th I think that uh, uh, it's a wonderful question. Keep, keep them coming, Kwesi, please. Um, <laughs> I think that there is, there is no set of people in, in the Americas that has a keener interest and connection in, in climate questions and environmental questions than Native people. Uh, and I, I guess that, that uh, the, the, uh, the impacts are, are obvious, whether you're talking about forests in Brazil or forests in California, uh, that, that uh, what's happening with, with environmental questions, ecological questions, and climate change is highly, highly damaging. The ray of hope that I see, but it depends upon lots of others besides native peoples to get this right, is a question that we were talking about. I think we were off mic actually when we were talking about part of it, uh, but that is that um, there are sources of wisdom relating to climate and climate management that I think uh, are, are quite credible and, and quite impactful if used. The example I will use here in California, I will illustrate with an example that ties the museum to native people to questions of ecological import. And that is when we were doing uh, an exhibit at the Autry that was, that was tied to uh, originating points of view in, from the native community on ecological and environmental matters here in the state of California. And we were talking about the subject of fire and I was with the principal curator, the native curator of that uh, section of the, of the exhibit. And we were going through sort of the uh, final walk uh, through that section of the exhibit. And, and I walked uh, into an area where, and we use a multiplicity of different kinds of objects. And there was a painting having to do with this subject, fire in, in, in California, wildfires. And the, the uh, man, a mono man, walked over to the painting and stood in front of it and just chuckled. And I walked over and I said, well, what's so funny? Tell me. And he said, well, you know, this is a beautiful painting, but I can promise you, Yosemite, the floor of Yosemite would have looked nothing like that when we were there. And what he was saying was that the, um, the monos and others in Northern California had intricate systems of controlled burning that actually cleared the forest of that kind of ground cover and therefore prevented far more catastrophic wildfires that California suffered to a fairly well just this past year. So, so there is knowledge that sits there. And I, and I would hope that just as we are damaged most often by, by the downside of climate change and what it's bringing, that you listen to what we say about some ways in which it might be mitigated. Thanks, Rick. I think uh, um, there's a lot of with indigenous knowledge systems that could help us with interventions. It's been acknowledged by the UN, but 
COP26 COP uh, in Glasgow, uh, end of last year, simply marginalized it in ways because the corporate sector, the investors, they go beforehand, you know, sort of to these meetings and they try to dominate the agenda. And it's a struggle, but then the, it's not about ice caps melting, but it's what at the same time, water levels rising in the Pacific where Tuvalu, Kiribati, I mean, countries are disappearing. The country's whole cultural systems, people's livelihoods are disappearing. And I think there are a lot of issues and I hope that ICOM would take it up uh, in, in, in Czech Republic when they meet later on this year, what ICOM actually, how it connects with indigenous people. Now, Rick, I know we are over time, but I just want to ask you one question that uh, internet, you were one of the critical team members with the establishment of the International Coalition for Sites of Conscience. And, uh, uh, you, you know, and you talked about the, the museum as a heritage site, and you actually have, you know, many sites of conscience, which are museum sites, which are part of it. Mm -hmm. can, can you tell us a little bit? I mean, I, I'm one of the people when the, Ruth Abrahams came to ICOM and she said they want, they want to propose a separate committee for sites of conscience. I said, Ruth, don't do it. Do it as a coalition. In ICOM, you'll be, you'll be subsumed, you know, the whole thing. You have to keep the integrity of your voice, your first voice. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, you know, leadership through you and now Alessandra Cummins, that first voice is being retained. Can you, our audience are not familiar with International Coalition for Sites of Conscience. Just a couple of sentences. What of of course, of course. And actually it should be, it should be our, our dear friend, Alessandra, who's saying this, who is online, I gather. But uh, I, I, early on, when, when the International um, Coalition for Sites of Conscience was formed, uh, came on board. And I did it for, for a couple of different reasons. And it has to do with everything we've talked about. Um, I, uh, I've always considered Sites of Conscience and that organization as being the forward wall of what museums should be thinking about and how they should be changing. And it goes back to this fundamental notion of museums as far more, not excluding, but far more than simply collections depots. And, and, and houses of collections. It goes to do with the civic and social role that they can take on if they wish to do so, that is far more community impactful than simply housing objects for people to see on a weekend visit. And that's what the International Coalition for Sites of Conscience and the Sites of Conscience do. And they do it in this way. There's power, there's a certain power to being sitting, to sitting right in the middle of the site itself when you're talking about an impactful historical event. Um, and that's what all of these are. In one way or another, they all are. But the point is of the site of con sites of, of the particular site of conscience is to take that history, understand it, and then create around it a form that speaks not only to what happened but how what happened can be avoided for the future or how the future can be different. And that's what I'm interested in. That's what I'm interested in for museums. It is that they be in tonality, in substance, in community impact, not as retrospective as they have been, but that they be much more prospective because I think that that will enhance their relevance and their value uh, to communities. And that has been the handiwork of the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. And that's why I've stuck with them and been on their board for most of my life as a museum director. It's seminal you work. Know, it's, an ambassador. Yeah, it's seminal work. And I think there's a, it's a fantastic team, all of us, how we work. But you know what you just said, there were major surveys. You know, ICOM did one survey, UNESCO one based on the 2015 recommendation of UNESCO on museums and co co collections and communities. And the simple conclusion there, all the surveys came to is exactly what you said. It's about museums and community engagement, that mm -hmm. understanding that 
the essence of community engagement, we are back to basics. If only people would listen to the first voice yeah. of oh, people, yeah. Oh, yeah. things would be different. But Rick, before we finish, I just want to acknowledge that, I mean, you, your life is inspirational. It's amazing what you, uh, what you have led and inspired so many of us, but not only inspiring, but you've been a constant source of strength for us so we can continue because uh, you talked about generational change when we talked about National Museum of Natural History. And, uh, but then some yeah, younger generations, they can't wait forever. So those changes need to take place. But you, you've been so strong in your leadership. And uh, I just want to acknowledge, you know, Mary Beth, uh, you know, the, the, uh, your other half, your better half, other half, whatever, <laughs> and, uh, and Professor Amy, uh, who is a professor of medicine, you know, the daughter, and Ben, who is a filmmaker, and your gorgeous grandchildren, you know, sort of Oliver and Finian. And when I see some photos of you with your grandchildren, you know, it, it's, just, it's just like everything you've done, you're doing it because for the next generation, the generation are after. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sort of, it's quite emotional when we watch those photos that Amy keeps posting on Facebook. Right. <laughs> just just a line about your family. It is, well, I, it, it is, and it's, it's uh, well, it wraps up this way. I, I, uh, I really think to take one piece of what you said that, that uh, I have finally retired and it's taken me about three tries to actually get it done. As you know, from having recited where I've been uh, at certain times in my life and at what museums. Um, but it is that uh, frankly, I decided that 80 year old men should not be directors of museums anymore, that they should indeed <laughs> vacate the spot and let somebody um, of the next generation take it on. Uh, I, I remain very much interested in this work. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you uh, at 6 a.m. on a Saturday in Los Angeles if I weren't. Um, so I, I maintain that kind of connection and I will do that. But you wrap up with exactly what I want to add to the mix now. And that is those two beautiful grandkids of mine because they are my only claim, as far as I'm concerned, to any, any kind of eternal life on which I can count, in which I can see in front of me. And, and so that's important to me. Uh, so I, I, uh, I happily uh, continue engaging a life that has been um, terribly rewarding to me, but then at the same time, preparing to move past my life and onto the lives of others who will run museums after me and who will be my descendants on this earth. So you, it all makes me very happy. Yeah, thank you. And for, from all of us, from all of us in this audience, the listeners, lots of love and best wishes to your family, to those gorgeous grandsons that you have. I think they keep you busy and young. And <laughs> so, but thank you very much. We'll have over, over time. I'm sorry, there are more questions, but we'll have to defer them. Thank you, Rick, once again, on behalf of Anant National University, which is hosting the Heritage Matters webinars and making them freely available uh, as a knowledge resource. We don't charge, these are free. And uh, so many people so far, we've had 49 experts from around the world and eminent people like you donating your time uh, because we want the next generation, the students, uh, the young people to listen, uh, you know, because one of the challenges that I find even within ICOM and various places is cultural amnesia, you know, and uh, we need to listen to the voices of people that have gone before us and learn from that and ask new questions, find new ways, new pathways to move forward. And, uh, and I think uh, this has been inspirational, Rick. And thank you very much on behalf of everybody. I'd like to uh, thank you, you know, heartfelt thanks and best wishes. Thank you. And thank you. It's been my honor and my pleasure. Thank you. Be well. <laughs>